Tyree Kill has been in the news for all the wrong reasons this summer. And even though the NFL just announced that they won't suspend him for the upcoming season, the actions he was accused of can obviously never be condoned. With that said, whether you like him or not as a man off the field, it's pretty much impossible to deny the guy's abilities on the turf. In just three seasons, the Cheetah has absolutely taken over the NFL. Whether he's taking carries, returning punts, or catching bombs down the sideline, the guy has shown time and time again that he only needs one play to completely change a game. Putting up an elite 12 touchdowns and almost 1,500 yards this past season through the air, while making his third Pro Bowl and second All-Pro team, and cementing himself as the most dangerous weapon in the entire league. Don't at me on that. But his stardom definitely wasn't always the expectation. In fact, going into the 2016 draft, the speedster wasn't even projected to get picked, and there ended up being 17 receivers selected before the Chiefs took a shot on the kid in the fifth round. So today, we're gonna take a look at exactly who those 17 players were, and how their careers have stacked up against Tyreek's incredible start. What's good everybody, and welcome back to the channel, where today, we're gonna break down and examine each of the 17 receivers that were chosen before Tyreek Hill in his own draft. Make sure to drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Before we jump into the players drafted before him, let's first look at how such an insanely talented guy dropped so damn far in the draft in the first place. So after two full years dominating in junior college on both the football field and the track, Tyreek entered 2014 as one of the most highly sought after recruits in the country before eventually deciding to attend Oklahoma State. After committing, he would immediately flash his generational versatility by taking snaps at running back, receiver, and returner, and combining for over 1,800 yards and 6 touchdowns through 12 games, against some pretty stiff competition. As that junior year wound to a close, Tyreek looked all set to gear up in the offseason for a monster senior year, and maybe even prepare to make his case to be a first or second rounder in 2016. That was until he got hit with a domestic violence charge and everything spiraled out of control. Just a few days after the arrest, Hill was completely dropped from the track and football programs. And even after landing a spot on the West Alabama football team, Tyreek's numbers took a big step back from the year before. The dip in production, combined with the criminal charges, made it look increasingly unlikely that the dude was going to get a call on draft, especially after not even getting an invite to the combo. Fortunately for him, through all the mistakes and controversy, the one thing he never lost was that mind-blowing speed, which he put on full display during West Alabama's Pro Day, clocking in with an outrageous 4-2-8 40-yard dash and pretty much forcing scouts to throw his name back on their boards. Ultimately, it was Andy Reid, who's had a history of taking in players with off-the-field issues, who decided to take the shot on Tyreek in the fifth round with the 165th overall pick. And I think it's safe to say the Chiefs have not regretted that decision since. But there were a whole lot of other teams who passed up on the Cheetah that you just know are absolutely kicking themselves. And at the top of that list has got to be the Cleveland Browns, who took the first receiver off the board that year with the 15th pick, Corey Coleman. Now to cut the Browns some slack, coming out of college, there's no question that Corey Coleman was that guy. I mean, dude put up 1,400 yards and 20 touchdowns in his final year at Baylor. Yeah, you heard me right. 20 touchdowns. 2-0. It was absurd. So it's not hard to see why he was the first guy at his position taken off the board. And the first of the four receivers taken in that round. But I don't know, man. Maybe he was just hit by the Browns curse that made, like, literally every one of their picks bust for, like, 10 years straight. But the guy just hasn't figured it out since he got to the league. Through three seasons and 27 games, Coleman's only managed to total 789 yards and five touchdowns. And last year for the Giants, he couldn't even crack the starting lineup for eight of his nine active games. Now it's still a little early to label pretty much anybody a bust after just three seasons, especially a receiver whose best quarterback has been a 38-year-old Eli Manning. But to avoid that label, he's gonna have to turn things around a lot sooner than later. Fortunately for the Browns, I have a hunch that they're not too worried about the receiver position at this point in time. And neither are the Texans, who took their own speedster to pair alongside DeAndre Hopkins just a couple picks later at 21 out of Notre Dame. Of course, I'm talking Will Fuller. It didn't take long for Fuller to prove himself as an elite deep threat in college. After posting over a thousand yards along with double digit touchdowns in both his sophomore and junior seasons. And he's more or less carried that ability into the league. Though the numbers might not jump at you, Fuller's played a crucial role in the Texans offense as the dangerous number two option opposite all pro DeAndre Hopkins. And before having his year cut short by injuries, was actually well on pace to cross a thousand yards in 2018. Now is he Tyreek Hill? Obviously not. But as long as Fuller can stay on the field, 
he can easily grow into being one of the NFL's best deep threat receivers in his own right, in that explosive Deshaun Watson-led offense. At pick 21, Fuller was actually the first of three straight receivers taken, with the very next pick being none other than Josh Doxson out of TCU. With this pick, the Redskins were bringing in a guy with the potential to be the best receiver in the class. 2,000 yard seasons, combined with a very impressive outing at the combine, made the 6'4 athletic specimen look like the full package. But after missing almost his entire rookie year with injuries, Daxton only put up 1,034 yards through the next two seasons. And while that might not seem terrible, keep in mind that that's been with damn near no competition at his position on that Washington team. And also, that he was drafted at 24 years old. And so he's pretty much like two years older than all the other guys in that draft. But I think it's pretty much a wrap for Doxton's hopes of living up to his draft position. To wrap up the first round, we got another guy that has yet to live up to the hype. And that's Vikings wideout Laquan Treadwell, who got chosen one spot later at 23rd overall. Coming out of Ole Miss with a strong 1,100 yards and 11 touchdowns in his junior year, Treadwell was actually pretty much a consensus top three receiver on draft boards, even after not putting on a great performance at the combine. At 6'2", 210, the guy already had the build of a big body Des Bryant, Alshon Jeffrey type receiver, and looked like he just needed a little bit of polish to reach that Pro Bowl level. But that has not happened. Through three seasons, Treadwell's actually ended up posting the worst stats of any of the first rounders, which isn't easy to do when you're up against Josh Doxton and Corey Coleman. With only a combined 517 yards in 40 active games and 15 starts. I mean, maybe he deserves some slack because he has to compete for targets against absolute studs like Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen. But at the same time, he was drafted a whole hell of a lot higher than those two were and had every chance to earn a starting job. Like Cleveland, Minnesota can't be too mad at this point when they have one of the best receiver duos in the league. But that sure as hell doesn't mean they don't regret this selection. And that takes us into the second round which honestly should have been swapped with the first rounders because all three of these guys are pretty nasty. First up, at 40th overall, we have the beastly slot out of Oklahoma, Sterling Shepard. Now going into the draft, the Giants were obviously looking for weapons to pair alongside Odell, and that's exactly what they got in Shepard, who put up nearly 1,300 yards and 11 touchdowns with a young Baker Mayfield in his last year at college, and carried that success into the pros. Through three seasons, the guys put up almost 2,300 yards and 14 scores, while improving his yardage every single year. While maybe not a superstar talent like number 13 was, Shepard has proven himself to be a more than capable number two option that can still absolutely kill a defense if they don't keep him in check. Finally separated from OBJ, it'll definitely be interesting to see if Shepard takes that next step forward and passes a thousand yards for a season. All right, now this next guy is 100% the biggest challenge to Tyreek on this list. And he's a pretty huge steal in his own right. I'm talking Saints stud, Michael Thomas, who was chosen 47th. Like Tyreek Hill, Thomas has been one of those rare players that actually look better in the pros than they did in college, as he never even crossed the 800 yard mark on a season at Ohio State, but has put up over a thousand in every single year of his NFL career, including over 1400 yards and 125 catches in 2018, which is just flat out dominant. Unlike Tyreek, who's a short, stocky, jack-of-all-trades type player that the league has really never seen before, Michael Thomas looks and plays like a created player in Madden. I mean, this dude's basically the prototype of a number one receiver. 6'3", 215, with a 4'5", 40 time, and a 40-inch vert. Can't ask for much more. And through just three years, Thomas has already cemented himself as a top 5-6 to six receiver in the game pushing aside established stars like AJ Green and Mike Evans on his way to the top, while also somehow simultaneously becoming one of the most underrated receivers in the league, whose name rarely gets mentioned alongside the Odells, Julios, and Antonio, even when his numbers could go head to head with just about any of them. Sure, you could say it helps that he's had an absolute goat throwing him the ball and a mastermind calling his plays from the sideline, but I mean, that doesn't discount how great he's been. Yeah, Tyreek Hill's amazing, but I don't think New Orleans changes this pick even if they had the chance. All right, moving on after that, to round out the second round, the Bengals chose Tyler Boyd with the 55th overall pick. After an impressive three-year run at Pittsburgh, where he put up 1,000 yards in two of his three seasons, Boyd came into the league polished and immediately ready to contribute, which is exactly what he did as a rookie, as he put up a very respectable 600 yards on 54 catches, while not even really playing as a starter behind AJ Green and Brandon LaFell. After dealing with some injuries throughout his second season, 
Boyd came back and stepped up in a big way in 2018, even filling the shoes of longtime Cincy superstar AJ Green, whose season was cut short by injuries, and breaking that 1,000 yard mark for the first time. To go along with a solid seven touchdown, with the right opportunity, I think he absolutely has the ability to be a number one receiver for a team, and has for sure outplayed his late second round draft position. All right, at this point in the video, those of you that have stuck around, who I appreciate by the way, are probably thinking to yourselves that this shit's gonna last about an hour, because there are still 10 guys left to go through. But I know you see that runtime, so don't fear. Because honestly, there's just not a whole lot to dive in for these remaining guys. And I'm really not trying to talk about Ricardo Lewis for more than like 30 seconds. No shade. All right, here we go. Heading into the third round with the 85th pick, the Texans took a shot on former Ohio State quarterback Braxton Miller, who we all know tried to make the transition after getting hurt in 2014. Well, spoiler alert, it hasn't really worked. He earned just 260 yards in his first two years in Houston, and then got placed on the Eagles practice squad in 2018, where it looks like he might have to stay for this upcoming year. After him, there was Leonte Carew. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but he went to the Dolphins with the very next pick, and has basically rode the bench his whole time in Miami, with only 192 yards through three seasons. I mean, probably the most notable thing he's done in the league happened last month when he got suspended four games for violating the substance abuse policy. I mean, that's a tough look when you've caught 12 balls in three years. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say his chances of staying in the league after this year look pretty slim. Next, there was Chris Moore, who the Ravens picked in the fourth at 107 overall. Moore isn't awful, but just really hasn't been able to see the field so far, with 44 catches and just about 500 yards on just four starts up to this point. Charging ahead, next up is a guy that is actually worth talking about for a second, because he could have done great things for a great organization, if not for some unfortunate injuries. Because he actually managed to contribute a good bit in his one year playing. If you didn't know, I'm talking about Malcolm Mitchell, who the Pats picked at 112 out of Georgia. Now don't get it twisted, it's not like he was a superstar at the gate, but the well-rounded rookie worked his way into the starting lineup while putting up a respectable 400 yards and four touchdowns in his first season along with an impactful 70 yards on six catches in the legendary 28-3 Super Bowl comeback against Atlanta. Unfortunately, due to a series of injuries, he had to retire early in 2019, making it a really sad case of a promising career cut short. All right, after him was Ricardo Lewis, who I just clowned, but honestly isn't even really that bad. He put up 562 yards on 96 catches with absolutely terrible quarterback play through his first two seasons for Cleveland before he also unfortunately had to deal with injury woes, missing all of 2018 and now 2019 with a neck issue. Chugging along, we hit another guy who's had some success with Farrell Cooper, who the Rams picked at 117. Now as a receiver, dude hasn't done much. Think along the same lines as Leontay Carew. That's pretty much how little he's done, with only 190 yards in three years. But where he has made his name is in the return game, which he dominated in 2017, all the way to a first team all pro selection. Now he had somewhat of a down year last season, probably because teams knew not to send it his way. But hey, first team all pro is first team all pro, regardless of how you get it. Next up, we have Demarcus Robinson, who Kansas City took at 126 and has also pretty much ridden the bench with 500 yards and 43 catches through three seasons, which was really only two seasons because he didn't see a snap as a rookie. Fortunately for KC, Pick and Tyreek more than made up for Robinson's lack of production. After him, we run into another solid player in Tajay Sharp, who is picked at 140 by the Titans and has pretty much been a starter throughout his short career. After a solid rookie year gaining over 500 yards and 40 catches on 10 stars, Sharp had to sit out his entire second year due to injury before coming back in 2018 and putting up a disappointing 316 yards. Jordan Payton, who was taken at 154 overall by the Browns. For those of you keeping track, that's three, count them, three receivers that the Browns took before Tyree Kill, none of which are on the Browns anymore. Just another example of how outrageously terrible this team was before getting John Dorsey. But anyways, Jordan Payton caught one single pass for three yards before getting suspended at the end of the season for PEDs and then subsequently getting cut by the Browns before the next season. I mean, Jesus. We've had some bad ones, but that's gotta be the worst one by far. But all right, finally, the last receiver taken before Tyreek in the 2016 draft was Trevor Davis at pick 163 to the Packers, who's made a decent mark in the return game while only gaining 92 yards through the air in three seasons. So there you have it. Every one of the 17 receivers whose names came off the board before Tyreek Hill. Now keep in mind, I was kind of clowning some of those later guys, but it's all in jest. 
We all know just how difficult it is to make it in the NFL, especially as a late round pick. So no disrespect to any of those guys. More than anything else, I think this list goes to show just how unique a player Tyreek Hill really is. I mean, 5'10", 180 pound deep that receivers do not do the things he's been able to do. They don't make the Pro Bowl in each of their first three years and first came all pro in two out of three years. They don't gain over 5,000 all-purpose yards, catch 223 balls, and score 34 touchdowns in that span. But somehow, Tyreek has. And with the terrible charges against him finally dropped, it doesn't look like the cheetah will be slowing down anytime soon. That's all I got for this one, guys. If you're new, drop a like and subscribe to the channel. We're going hard for the rest of the summer. Until next time, keep balling.